Many modern Christians have substantial personal wealth, and they don't want to give it away, especially not to sinful people doing sinful things. However, the teachings of Christ do not justify this miserly behavior. In fact, the teachings of Christ seem to sharply contradict the attitudes and lifestyles of modern Christians. My contention for this video is that, if a Christian is not poor, then they are not following the teachings of Christ. Christians should be poor. To be clear, my goal in making this video is not to try and disprove Christianity. My goal is simply to persuade Christians to be consistent about their religion and its teachings, just as they would do when faced with someone from another religion who didn't seem to be following it. From my reading of the Gospels, it seems very clear that Jesus had a simple and unambiguous message about personal wealth. Jesus commanded his followers to give everything away so they would be fully committed to God, which includes giving away their wealth to thieves who would want to steal it from them, and to immoral people doing immoral things, with no qualifiers about who they were giving their money to, or what kinds of behaviors their money might incentivize. As I will argue, this message is very clear throughout Jesus' teachings, and it's one which modern Christians are systematically trying to avoid, especially conservative Christians. This message is most clearly seen in the following Gospel passages. Matthew 5, 40-42 And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, give your coat as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to the one who asks of you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. Luke 6, 29-30 If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who asks of you, and if anyone takes away what is yours, do not ask for it back again. Luke 12, 32-34 Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourself that do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Luke 14, 27 through 33. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost, to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. And, for good measure, Jesus says in Matthew about working and maintaining material wealth for yourself, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not so much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who seek all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So, my challenge to Christians is, why do you think these passages don't mean that you should get rid of your material wealth? How can you justify your comfortable first-world lifestyle, 
and how can American conservative Christians justify their opposition to welfare programs? How do you get out of these inconvenient teachings of Jesus? Of course, Christians have had 2,000 years to come up with answers, so let's go through some of the most common ones. Number 1. The Teachings of Paul In multiple places, Paul said that you should work enough to support yourself, and that those who do not work should not eat. So, if we want to reconcile the teachings of Paul with the teachings of Jesus, we can safely assume that Jesus must have meant give up your possessions to mean give them up to God, or something like that. Not that we should physically relinquish all our possessions and stop working, simply that we should accept the fact that God is the ultimate owner of everything, and that he can take everything away from us at any time. Response number one. If you believe that there cannot be any tension or conflict between the books of the Bible, if you believe in biblical inerrancy, then you need to decide whose words we should take at face value and whose words we should reinterpret, the words of Jesus or the words of Paul. Jesus' words, by themselves, clearly command us to physically relinquish all our possessions. Paul's words, however, clearly say that we should maintain enough material wealth to support ourselves, so how do Christians decide whose words to take at face value and whose words to reinterpret? Most Christians will choose to take the words of Paul at face value and to reinterpret the words of Jesus. However, they rarely explain why they chose to prioritize the words of Paul over the words of Jesus on the topic of personal wealth. How did they decide that Paul's words can be taken at face value on this topic, but Jesus' words need to be reinterpreted? Why not take Jesus' words at face value and reinterpret Paul's words? That would seem to be the correct Christian way to reconcile different books of the Bible, to give priority to the words of Jesus, of God-made flesh. The fact that modern Christians instead give priority to the words of Paul suggests to me that they don't really believe in following Jesus. They just want to keep their wealth. In addition to the question of whose words to take at face value and whose to reinterpret, there is a more foundational question of whether or not Paul's teachings about personal wealth even belong in the Bible in the first place. Do the words of Paul even need to be reconciled with the words of Jesus? I know it sounds crazy to a modern Christian viewer, but consider, what does a false prophet look like? How can we identify false teachings? What should be the standard for whether or not an idea truly came from God? Most Christians will acknowledge that false prophets exist to this day. So the question is, how can you tell if a prophet's inspiration is genuine? How can you tell which ideas are coming from God and which ones are not? What is your standard? It seems to me that the only reasonable standard is, well, Jesus, God in the flesh. If Jesus says one thing, and a later prophet says something different, then it's probably safe to say that the prophet's teaching was not divinely inspired, because it contradicts Jesus, who is God in the flesh. This is why Kenneth Copeland is not divinely inspired, this is why Pat Robertson is not divinely inspired, and this, too, is why Paul should not be considered divinely inspired, at least not on the topic of personal wealth. Paul claimed that we should work and toil enough to support ourselves, whereas Jesus clearly said that God will support you, just as he supports the birds and the lilies. On this topic, therefore, we should conclude that Paul was not divinely inspired, and that there is no need to reconcile Paul's teachings about personal wealth with Jesus' teachings about personal wealth. Paul was simply mistaken on this point. By the same standard we use to identify other false prophets— Paul's teachings about personal wealth are clearly not divinely inspired, because they are at odds with the words of Jesus. I understand that Paul holds a special place in the hearts of modern Christians, but on the topic of personal wealth, he is simply a less bombastic version of people like Pat Robertson and Kenneth Copeland, denying the words of Jesus because he wants to serve two masters. Modern Christians are no better, as they choose to take literally the words of Paul, while reinterpreting the words of Jesus. If modern Christians want to avoid selling all their possessions and giving up their treasures on earth, 
They cannot hide behind the words of Paul. Number 2. Jesus did not want us to support immoral people doing immoral things. In Matthew 7, verse 6, Jesus specifically says, Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them underfoot and turn and maul you. This clearly teaches us to withhold our possessions from immoral people doing immoral things. This verse clearly teaches us to discriminate with regard to who we give our wealth to. Response number two. With regard to Matthew 7, 6 and not giving what is holy to dogs, we need to ask the question, what things are holy? What things fit into this category which we should not give to dogs? It seems to me that within the category of things Jesus considered holy, money is not present, and Jesus was not telling his followers to withhold money or material wealth. I get this from the contrast Jesus repeatedly paints between the things of God and the things of this earth. This is a fundamental and repeated distinction Jesus draws, the treasures of heaven and the treasures of earth. Make for yourselves heavenly purses that don't wear out. Store up your treasures in heaven where thieves cannot steal them. Give to God what is God's and give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Holy, non-holy. So, to answer the question about what is holy, Jesus was quite clear about this. Material goods and material wealth are not holy, but devotion, love, and compassion to or in the name of God are holy. This is a recurring theme of Jesus' teachings throughout the Gospels. Love and devotion and obeying the scriptures are holy. Money and possessions are not. Thus, in context, Matthew 7, 6 is telling us to not give what is holy, love, devotion, etc., to people who would scorn these things, trample them underfoot, and take advantage of us, turn and maul you. This passage is almost certainly not talking about money when it refers to what is holy. This means that Matthew 7, 6 is not a command to withhold money from unrighteous people, it is a command to withhold what is holy from them, love, devotion, etc. Matthew 7, 6 does not provide an escape hatch from Jesus' earlier command to give to everyone who begs from you. Again, I remind everyone of the passage just two chapters earlier, Matthew 5, 42. Give to the one who asks of you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. There is no qualifier about who the person is. It literally says, anyone. At no point in the Gospels does Jesus command us to withhold money or wealth from unrighteous people who are doing unrighteous things. In fact, not only does Jesus not command us to withhold money from unrighteous people, he actually commands us to give our material wealth to unrighteous people if they try to steal it from us. In Luke 6, verses 29 through 30, Jesus says, from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who asks of you, and if anyone takes away what is yours, do not ask for it back again. By definition, a person who steals, takes away, from you, is an unrighteous person doing an unrighteous thing, taking things that don't belong to them. And yet, Jesus commanded his followers to voluntarily give up even more to such a person when they attempt to steal from you. This command actually rewards and encourages unrighteous behavior. And yet, Jesus doesn't seem bothered by this at all. He outright commanded it. So as we've now seen, Matthew 7, 6 is likely not talking about literal pearls or other material wealth. And Jesus' command to give to everyone who begs from you clearly includes giving money and material wealth to unrighteous people doing unrighteous things. And why shouldn't it? It's just money and material wealth. These things mean nothing compared to the kingdom of God. Number three, Jesus is speaking to an individual person in Matthew 19, 21. In the case of Matthew 19, 21, when Jesus tells the young ruler to sell all his possessions, Jesus is speaking to the young ruler specifically, not to people in general. Thus, Jesus' command to sell everything does not apply to anyone else. Jesus saw the ruler's heart and prescribed a specific course of action for him. 
Jesus wanted to expose the heart of the young ruler and call him to repentance. Response number three. I actually agree with this assessment. I think it is fair to say that Jesus was speaking specifically to the young ruler in this passage, which is why I did not include this passage in the opening of this video. However, this point about who Jesus is speaking to will come back to bite Christians later. Stay tuned for that. It is worth noting, however, that after Jesus advises the young ruler to sell everything he owns, Jesus goes on to generalize this advice, saying that it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Not just that rich man, any rich man. Understandably, his disciples react with surprise and trepidation, wondering if anyone can enter the kingdom if that's true. This message is very harsh, and it was clearly meant to apply to more than just the young ruler, although it is true that Matthew 19.21 specifically is only addressed to the young ruler. Number 4. A camel through the eye of a needle isn't what you think it is. Jesus taught that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. But, the eye of the needle is actually just a narrow gate in Jerusalem designed for pedestrians, which a camel could pass through, albeit with some difficulty. When Jesus makes this analogy, he is warning about becoming too attached to your wealth, not about having wealth of any kind. Response number four. There is simply no good evidence that any such gate was ever referred to as an eye of the needle in the first century or earlier. This name is simply a legend, whose first mention is over a thousand years later during the 15th century, possibly as early as the 11th century. The idea that the eye of a needle is something a camel could still pass through is a medieval Christian legend. Frankly, this legend looks like a convenient way to soften Jesus' harsh message about personal wealth, something which modern Christians are still eager to attempt. For a more detailed review of this argument, you can watch Religion for Breakfast's video, The Camel and Needle, Did Scholars Mistranslate Jesus' Famous Saying? Number 5. If we gave everything away, then we'd have nothing left to give. If we gave everything away, then we soon wouldn't have anything left to give. Therefore, there must be a more complete context to Jesus' statement to sell all you have and give it all to the poor. If Jesus really wanted us to give away everything, well then, we wouldn't have anything left to give, and we would no longer be able to follow this command. Response number five. Having nothing left seems to be the ultimate goal of Jesus' instructions. Jesus says that, Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, and none of you can become my disciple unless you give up all your possessions, among the other passages I've cited. These verses coherently paint a picture which compels us to sell all our possessions and give to everyone who asks, until we have no treasure left on earth, which seems to be the ultimate goal, to be fully committed to God and his kingdom, while at the same time, not coincidentally, being kind to the people on earth around you. The point is not to give away for its own sake, but for the ultimate goal of being fully committed to the kingdom of God. This is a coherent, well-repeated message, and it is easily understood from what Jesus said. Modern Christians' concern about not having anything left to give sounds like something Scrooge McDuck said. He can't give to the poor, because then they wouldn't be poor anymore. Clever, right? No, it's not clever, it misses the point. The point is not simply to give to the poor for its own sake. The point is for the poor to not be poor anymore. That's the ultimate goal. Here's another analogy to help explain this point. We all agree that caring for sick and injured people is a good thing to do, and that we should do it. Now, imagine if someone argued that we should never completely cure sickness or injury because caring for these people is a virtue, and we don't want to eliminate a virtue, do we? Would that make any sense? Would you agree that we should always maintain some sick and injured people so that we can virtuously care for them? No, of course not. The entire point of caring for the sick and injured is to try and eliminate sickness and injury. That's the underlying goal here. 
not simply to act out caring for its own sake. We may say that it's virtuous to care for the sick and injured, but it's clear that the goal here is to eliminate sickness and injury, not simply to care for it indefinitely. In the exact same way, it's clear that Jesus' goal was for his followers to eliminate their possessions in a constructive way, not simply to give for its own sake. So yes, the goal is in fact to eliminate sickness, to eliminate poverty, and to get rid of everything you own in order to be fully committed to the kingdom of God. That is the clear, coherent picture painted by Jesus. Number 6. Jesus taught about degrees of sacrifice, not all or nothing. The story of Zacchaeus clearly illustrates that giving up your possessions is not an all or nothing command. In Luke 19 verses 1 through 10, Jesus is speaking to a tax collector named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus says that he has given away half of his wealth, and Jesus replies by saying that salvation has come to this house, which means that it was enough for Zacchaeus to give away half of his wealth, not all of it. Thus, Jesus was teaching about degrees of sacrifice, not giving away literally everything. Zacchaeus was commended for giving away half of his riches. Response number six. In the story of Zacchaeus, Jesus is speaking specifically to Zacchaeus, which, if we're being consistent, should mean that we cannot take this to be a command for everyone. Remember the passage in Matthew where Jesus was speaking specifically to the young ruler? Well, this is where that same argument comes back to bite Christians in the butt. In the story of Zacchaeus, Jesus is speaking specifically to Zacchaeus, not to a general audience. In contrast, every time Jesus does speak to a general audience, his message is to get rid of everything. If Jesus' words to the young ruler in Matthew 19 were only meant for the young ruler, then you need to admit that Jesus' words to Zacchaeus in Luke 19 were only meant for Zacchaeus. As a result, the story of Zacchaeus is not an escape hatch from Jesus' general teaching to give up all that we own. Number 7. Property Rights in the Old Testament The Eighth Commandment says not to steal, which requires the existence of material wealth and property rights. People need to own some things in order for the Eighth Commandment to make sense. The Old Testament makes it very clear that property rights exist. Therefore, Jesus' teachings cannot be about literally letting people steal things from you. Response number seven. The first and most obvious response is simply that not owning anything is perfectly compatible with not stealing anything. You can obey these teachings of Jesus and also obey the Eighth Commandment. For any given individual who wants to follow Jesus, the Eighth Commandment does not prohibit them from doing as Jesus says. However, I can appreciate the idea that the Eighth Commandment implies the existence of property rights more generally, and that, in practice, Jesus' teachings seem to nullify the spirit of this commandment if everyone were to follow them. But the solution is rather simple. According to most modern Christians, Jesus' words are supposed to modify and supersede the laws of the Old Testament. This is a foundational idea of modern Christianity, Jesus fulfilled the old laws, and now he has new instructions as part of the new covenant, such as when Jesus contravened the Jewish dietary restrictions, or an eye for an eye, or not working on the Sabbath. Why should it be any different when Jesus clearly and repeatedly talks about giving away our wealth and not asking for our stolen things back? If the words of Jesus really can be modifications and updates to the Old Testament laws, then Jesus' command to give everything away should be accepted as a modification to the Eighth Commandment. You cannot pick and choose when to employ this foundational Christian theology and when to ignore it because you don't like it. Number 8. The Parable of the Talents Tells Us to Make Wise Investments In Matthew 25 and Luke 19, Jesus says that the slave who invested the money he was given did something good, whereas the slaves who spent and saved it did something wrong. So how can we make wise investments if we don't have anything to invest? Clearly, Jesus intended for us to not only have personal wealth, but to grow it. Response number eight. That's why it's a parable. 
The story didn't literally happen, it's just an analogy to explain a principle. What could that principle be? Well, given Jesus' other non-parable commands to sell your possessions and let God feed and clothe you, and that money doesn't matter compared to the kingdom of God, the parable of the talents is almost certainly not about financial investments, just as the parable of the sower almost certainly is not about farming. This is how parables work. The parable of the talents makes much more sense as an explanation of how to use the gifts of God, love, kindness, etc., and to multiply them by acting them out towards others and encouraging those people to do the same. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. To say that the parable of the talents is about making good financial investments is like saying that the parable of the sower is about farming. It's simply a failure to understand what a parable is. Conclusion the brutal, simple conclusion is this. Christians should be poor. If you really want to follow Jesus, then you should give away all your material wealth in order to be fully committed to the kingdom of God. If you really want to follow Jesus, then you should let people steal from you and give to them even more than they stole, because material wealth is meaningless compared to the kingdom of God. This message is not ambiguous, and it does not require detailed hermeneutics. These passages are not written in some kind of mysterious code. They're written in complete sentences, using simple analogies, with a clear overarching theme. And they're supposed to be the words of God himself, as he reveals his new covenant to us. You don't get much more clear and final than that. And yet... Christians keep desperately trying to dig deeper into these simple commands. To put it simply, modern Christians live in fear that the Bible actually means what it says. Jesus Christ clearly instructed Christians to get rid of all their possessions, to abandon their treasures on earth so they can build up their treasures in heaven. If you cannot do this, then you cannot be a follower of Jesus. If you are a Christian, then you need to accept that this is what Christ actually said. Or, you can admit that you've chosen to ignore him.